Good evening. Welcome to the next episode of Thinker's Dialogue. Uh, we have a very special guest today uh, with us. Uh, he is Ravi Venkateshan. Um, I'm sure uh, you must have heard about this person uh, for right reasons or wrong reasons. Like the question is, it has, always has to be the right reason. Uh, in fact, 80% uh, of us in India have actually used a product from a company that he used to actually head at one point in time called Microsoft. Uh, so uh, that uh, Microsoft in India, but then more than that, he's a Harvard Business School alumni. Uh, in fact, uh, I met Ravi about a decade back uh, and that was uh, through the, uh, uh, what I call the process of quota prize that we were doing. And I think he's just been one of the biggest pillars of support for us to really make that uh, initiative a success. Uh, in fact, he is incidentally uh, a Baker Scholar at the Harvard Business School. Uh, in fact, uh, that would mean that he's a topper in the class. Uh, he's member of uh, the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, mem board member of the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, in fact, he was uh, chairman of the Bank of Baroda. Uh, in fact, and then he's also been the co-chairman for Infosys. Uh, and then he runs a very interesting thing today called GAME, which is Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship. And as well, he is the special representative for young people and innovation at UNICEF. Uh, so uh, this is what Ravi is. In fact, uh, if we start talking about him, we can spend an hour in terms of his accomplishments, what he's done, what is he trying to do. Uh, but I think today is uh, what we are really, and then of course, one more important thing that both of us are from Chandigarh. Uh, and uh, that is what I just realized today, a few hours back when I got a call from a friend, that Ravi is a Johnny and I said, oh wow, I need to check with him. Uh, and uh, he is from the 1978, uh, 77, uh, right? Uh, pass out from St. John's uh, and I'm sure you're part of Sajoba and everything. And that's where it is. So. Uh, uh, he comes from Chandigarh, uh, Sector 28. I come from Chandigarh, Sector 10. Uh, that, that's the other story, but we have never met in that part of the world. Ravi, thanks a lot for uh, joining in, and it's just a pleasure uh, to have you with us today. Hey, thank you for that gracious uh, introduction, Amit, and thank you for welcoming me to your show. I look forward to this conversation. Uh, th thank you, Ravi. So, Ravi, we will quickly... Uh, get into the conversation, you know, like your work specifically in the area of entrepreneurship. I really want to do, and your understanding of entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, like one of the statements that you make very powerfully, that some countries break away and suddenly become innovative and prosperous. How does that happen? Why does that actually happen? Yeah, look, I'm a great uh, sort of student of history. And this is one of the central um, questions that puzzles you know, economists and business historians, and it's called the great divergence. And the great divergence is, you, you know, if you look at the world till about the 1700, um, the productivity everywhere is about the same, okay? Because they're largely agrarian and craft space industries with you know, differences. But, suddenly something happens in the 18th century and the industrial revolution takes off and it starts in all, for, in all places, it starts in England. And why do I say in all places? Because at that time, um, you know, in 1700s, uh, England was not necessarily uh, the most uh, advanced of the European countries. I mean, France and Italy were, uh, you know, uh, Spain were much uh, ahead in economic terms. And yet this industrial revolution takes off in Britain, creates extraordinary wealth, makes it a great power. And then you come back another 150 years later, the mantle of leadership has moved. The great divergence is now happening in America, right? So you look at the second and third industrial revolutions with electricity, automobiles, and then computers. That's sort of uh, that those revolutions start in um, the United States. Now the mantle of that uh, is shifting to China. Okay, so the real question is what is happening that, in, that some countries are suddenly able to break away from their peer group from their own past and get off on a really positive trajectory? And what will it take to emulate that in our country, in India, right? Because we desperately need a positive revolution, economic and social revolution. And so um, there are lots of different hypotheses about this. There's no complete concurrence. But the, the, the thesis that I have, have been most influenced by and most partial to is by 
a Nobel Prize winning economist called Ned Phelps, who's now become a good friend and a mentor. He's about 81 years old and lives, uh, teaches at Columbia. And he wrote this beautiful book called Mass Flourishing. It's beautiful if you have the energy and patience to get through it because it's pretty dense. And he says, look, what, what propels these countries onto a different trajectory is something happens which we don't quite understand why, but suddenly there's an environment in which ordinary people, often uneducated, of no great means or qualifications, uh, feel empowered to start expressing their creativity. And some of them you know, express it in artistic ways, but many start inventing, tinkering, starting a small business, and then some of them become successful or moderately successful. That inspires many more to start doing it. And pretty soon there is this flywheel effect and you've got, uh, you know, wave after wave of successful inventors and entrepreneurs. And so if you look at the seminal inventions of the first industrial revolution, the steam engine, the locomotive, the automatic spinning wheel, which destroyed the weavers in India, the uh, process for making wrought iron. You look at the seminal inventions of the second uh, industrial revolution and it's you know Edison and Ford and Singer and all these people. Nine out of 10 were illiterate and from the most humble means. They weren't the elite who were educated at some, you know, the Oxford and Cambridge and MIT and Harvard. They were not the elite. They were the most ordinary and humble people who did extraordinary things. And so, you know, uh, that's what's so interesting that uh, how do you produce the conditions where everybody feels empowered to start expressing themselves in these ways? Now, then I said, oh, OK, very interesting. Then I ran into another guy, a professor at Cornell called Victor Nee. And Victor has written this amazing book on how did China take off? And he says, look, the biggest fallacy, the biggest myth is that China's uh, success was government driven and top down. In fact, it happened despite the government. It happened in the very same ways that Ned Phelps talks about, which is a bottoms up revolution. So um, Deng Xiaoping comes, he begins to unshackle the economy, reduce some of the barriers to people beginning to have property rights and uh, start businesses. Pretty soon there's some modest entrepreneurial activity happening in the Yangtze Delta. The first successes inspire the next few entrepreneurs. They somehow managed to overcome all the obstacles and impediments that the system puts on them, which is determined to shut them down. And then they start forming networks of suppliers, distributors, investors, people who lend money. And then the clusters begin to emerge like the toy cluster, the textile cluster, the electronics cluster, and these become world beating. Then suddenly the government wakes up and says, man, this is a real important engine of wealth creation and job creation, and we better learn how to get out of the way a little bit. And so I said, this seems to be the most plausible thesis of how countries become prosperous. And by the way, we don't have to look outside. Uh, you know, in my writings, I talk a lot about the IT revolution in uh, in India, the IT services uh, revolution that started in the, you know, right around 1990 in Bangalore, and then of course took off. That too was a bottoms up, bubbling up. It didn't require a lot of intervention, but from the government. And then you had the early entrepreneurial successes of a Wipro and an Infosys and whatnot, and the same old saga repeats itself. So I'm a big, big, big believer that this is there's something powerful here and the most important thing is hey what actually then triggers this condition that uh, enables any ordinary person to start doing things and that turns out to be embracing what ned calls modern values you know in all our development discourse in india or anywhere else you seldom you hear about you hear about policy and this thing and so forth, but you don't hear about culture and values being the central idea, um, and that's what I love about this, which because it fits so perfectly with all the empirical evidence and my own experiences. Long-winded answer, but you asked for it. <laughs> this is fascinating, uh, uh, 
Ravi. But then I have a couple of questions. Like you point to a very interesting point of creativity out here. It's the creativity which probably propels the whole idea of entrepreneurship or flourishing or creation of firms and things. So how, how do you look at that whole aspect of creativity? Because creativity can really be looked at from a very large perspective and things like, so is it just about breaking things, looking at things in a newer way or something else? No, the, no, the, the, the central idea here or belief you need to have here is creativity and talent are there in every human being and they're pretty equally distributed. What is not equally distributed is access to opportunity. Okay. And that's where I think India is particularly tough and unequal. So um, when you look at our country, you know, geog the, the phrase geography is destiny is just so apt. <laughs> okay. If you're born in Bangalore, your opportunity set is one thing, even if you're the son of a driver or, uh, you know, uh, a class four government employee or whatever. Uh, if same thing, if you're born in Muzaffarpur, your opportunity set, your environment, your culture that shapes you, everything is completely different. So this is the issue. So number one, one billion people, or at least 850 million people, um, are still at a poverty level. And so it doesn't matter how much creativity and an unbelievable talent you have, your life is pretty much an existential, is an existential treadmill. Okay, so that's one issue. The second one is for vast swaths of India, it doesn't apply to the cities where you and I live in and probably where most of our listeners are calling in from. But in vast swaths of India, it meant things like religion, caste, gender, et cetera, still manage profoundly in terms of what you can do and what, more importantly, what you believe you can do. So whatever creativity, talent, et cetera, you have inside you remains un unrealized to the greatest part. So what we have to try and think about and uh, do is how do you begin to slowly to unshackle this, which is no trivial thing, okay? Uh, but to me, this is the issue. And the one area I think where India has actually broken free of these shackles is probably in cricket. If you think about cricket, till not long ago, maybe 20, 20 years ago or so, it used to be still fairly an elite or upper middle class kind of activity. Okay. And, India used to do sort of middlingly uh, on the world stage. Our success has come because we opened up access uh, to every young person, boy and girl. And today, if you look at our cricketing talent, a lot of them are not a native English speakers. They don't all come from big cities. And that is what has infused aggression, capability, talent into our uh, cricketing um, squad and the rest is history. So I think there's some powerful uh, lessons for us in terms of how we think about talent. Does that make That's, sense? Absolutely. So Ravi, what, what you're meaning here is, when you say access to opportunity, that means it is about freedom to do something, freedom to think, freedom to think that, yes, I can do it. So what, what you're really saying is it's about pushing people into the freedom of thought, Really Correct. into that direction. Yes, uh, but mindset, mindset. Yes, so that, that's the mindset issue. But then if you really look at this, I, I personally believe, I could be horribly wrong, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always found India to be exceedingly creative, argumentative, very critical at points in time, but somehow it is not translated into the activity that you're saying. We've had the preconditions to be there or get there, but somehow we've just faltered somewhere. Look, creativity and argumentativeness on social media doesn't necessarily equate to entrepreneurial or scientific progress, okay? There's just a lot of random noise out there, which, you know, um, I, I don't know. I think it's just what's called Brownian motion. It's just random energy being dissipated. What I'm talking about is something very different. Um, 
And for the first and most important thing is you have to be unleashed in your mind. You have to believe that I am, I can make more of the decisions that influence my life, no matter what my current circumstances are. Okay, you, you have to have role models of success that inspire your progress and motion, okay? And this is what is most central if you have to take the enormous talent, creativity, and energy that India clearly has and direct it towards this endeavor. And this is what we're trying to do through giant experiments, uh, Amit. So for instance, for two, two and a half years, uh, we've worked with Delhi government on running the, these, uh, this ha what is called the happiness curriculum. Um, but uh, it's basically an entrepreneurial mindset curriculum in classes eight through 12. And essentially the, the government of Delhi, you know, all power to them, um, have made the first period in all government schools a compulsory subject on entrepreneurship. And what we do is get young people to develop the sense that belief, self-belief that they can actually solve problems. We teach them how to solve practical problems. If the school toilet is broken, how do you go fix it? We teach them how do you do uh, work in teams, creativity. And then the capstone program is where the government gives them a thousand rupees each and they form teams and launch a business and run it during the summer months. Exactly like your Harvard Business School, by the way. And at the end of the summer, they have to return the thousand rupees loan and then they can keep the profits. And some 90% of the teams actually make a profit. And suddenly they're switched on. In the curriculum, they're exposed to role models of entrepreneurial success, but not a Sachin or Binni Bansal who they cannot relate to, but people of their own backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds who've done well and doing way better than they could have imagined. And interestingly, what happened is during, you know, when COVID hit, we began to see lots of anecdotal evidence of these kids starting home businesses with their parents. You know, the mask sanitizer, the home food and all that stuff. So in fact, we're going back and doing an evaluation. So I think it is not enough to just pride ourselves on being argumentative and creative and jugad and all these things. Yeah, that's all potential energy. It is important to harness that and channel it and that so that it can become kinetic energy. Uh, I, I will come back to this whole idea of the uh, curriculum and building an entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial mindset, but I have a question on the idea of values that you were saying. Yeah. That's a very important point. Uh, so when you say, there's of course this, uh, in your writings, you have alluded to that, that there is this rise of modern values, which uh, are the basic stepping stones for success of countries. Well, where do we stack up? How, how do you really look at India in this case? So first of all, what do we mean by modern values? Modern values doesn't mean that you, you know, the clothes you wear and, uh, you know, how you party. That's not modern values. Um, modern values according to Ned, is fundamentally the belief. It's a democratic belief that everybody has talent, everybody has creativity, and every single human being has the right to make decisions and choices in pursuit of a better life. Okay? This is hugely fundamental. Now, if you look at India, in, certainly in some cities, in some places, this is true, okay? In Bangalore, where I live, that's by and large true. But you go to large parts of interior India, particularly the northern half of India, and this is not by any means the dominant belief. Then he, Ned talks about other modern values. For instance, the right to ambition. He talks about agency, the belief, the belief that you are in cho charge of your life and the choices you make, not your parents, not society, not you know, the planets and so on and so forth. Um, risk taking, and with risk comes failure, the acceptance and tolerance of failure. That's a modern value. And again, if you see our most entrepreneurial cities like Mumbai, Gurgaon, Bangalore, maybe Hyderabad, whatever, 
you see these things. In much of India, this is not true. Then you go beyond what Ned talks about and I define some more modern values. For instance, the scientific method, okay? Which is, you just don't believe in some quackery, okay? But you believe in evidence-based decisions, evidence-based conclusions. And we saw a lot of that during COVID, where you know, people were peddling all kinds of remedies of dubious efficacy. And equally, there is skepticism around vaccines. And this is not true in India alone. It's true globally, but whatever. Belief in, the sci in science is a modern value. Belief in the rule of law, that is a system of rules that we have to adhere to and with, which everybody has to adhere to, no matter how rich or powerful. And the rule of law is equal to all, is a modern value. And then you look at our country. Where are we? I think... You can point to some exceptional pockets, but by and large, we the big revolution from, that covers most of India's population is still ahead of us. And if anything, in the last few years, I think on some of these attributes, I, I don't have evidence, but my sense is that the trend is actually negative. So um, I think the what I'm hoping will start from your conversation or our conversation, Amit, is how do we make a discussion around values and culture mainstream, because if we don't shift this, I doubt we're going to make a lot of sustainable progress. It'll be you know, fitful progress of two steps forward and one or two steps back, shuffling around. And this idea of a 5 trillion economy and our legitimate place at the global table is gonna remain illusory without addressing these issues of values and culture. And by the way, the business world has made that shift. You know, every second person quotes some, um, who's that great uh, business philosopher who says, uh, strategy, culture eats strategy for breakfast or something. Mintzberg. Huh? Mintzberg, Henry Mintzberg? No, no, it wasn't Henry Mintzberg, it was someone else. Uh, but whatever, the idea that culture determines the destiny of a company, culture determines performance. You can have all the strategies in the world, but ultimately the belief system of your people will determine what you can and cannot accomplish. I think the business world, this has now become gospel and a truism. I think the same has to pervade economics and all our discussions around development. Yeah, so the quote I think was made by Peter Drucker, if I'm uh, not- That's wrong. right, that's right, thank yeah. you. It was yeah. Peter Drucker. Thank you. So, so coming to this whole aspect of values, you make a very, very powerful statement here. And you're also saying that somehow we are not really making enough progress. Um, but what we say, and you yourself said, like, of course, the world over, we are seeing this whole divergence that is actually happening. What is really pushing this into that direction? I have to ask you that question. Like, Why are we really moving into that negative trajectory? Not only in, in India, but many other parts of the world what we are seeing in US is absolutely astonishing. Uh, the whole thing is just taking a step back. Why, why is that happening? That's it's a great question. That's a great question. And I, you know, I've tried to understand that myself. It's not like I have any original view, but what I've come to believe after reading and listening and talking to lots of people is we are in a period of extreme change, okay? The, in the 21st century, the world is going to change more than in all of human history. Okay, so we do, it's gone from linear change to exponential change. And with that change, it's like a tsunami, which is wiping away established models, structures, institutions, which were all giving people a sense of stability sense of, you know, being anchored and so forth. So you look at, for instance, the rate of change and what this has meant for the world order just in the last week, right? The world or post second world war order shaped by the United States has taken a body blow with, you know, what has happened and played out in Afghanistan. And like this, you're seeing this play out everywhere. So as a result, people, all of us are disoriented. And trust is breaking down. Our faith in leaders, our faith in institutions, our faith in rule-based systems is eroding. 
And so what has happened is in this fluid space, there is room for new narratives. And any joker who with a compelling sort of uh, oratory is able to propose a new narrative and attract followers. So what you're seeing is from a convergence around views, we are moving to a very large divergence. And this is happening in every part of the world. Certainly it's happening in India. It's happening in the US, which are the two countries I think most of us tend to uh, straddle. It's happening in Europe, it's happening everywhere. And so I think it is very largely to do with the extraordinary rate of change. And therefore we're in for a tough time because the rate of change is accelerating. It's not like we're going to get stability in 10 years. Uh, we've unleashed a set of forces which are only going to make this uh, ratchet up. And so I think individuals, leaders, institutions, we need to find new GPS systems to navigate this uh, turbulence. I have a question from the audience here. In fact, uh, there's a person called Bala Chandran who's asking that question, and I, I would read it out for you. I think we as a country believe that creativity emanates only from convergent thinking. Wouldn't you think that solutions to problems sometimes come about as a result of processes that bring about sudden changes in the way the problem is perceived for which divergent thinking is critical? As a country, I don't think we promote divergent thinking during our learning years, which reflects in our limitation to exhibit true creativity. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Bala. I think the education system in our country, similar to education systems in virtually every part of the world, are designed for a world that no longer exists. Okay, the world it was designed for about 100, 150 years ago was, a, uh, was one where information is, was very scarce. And so there was a lot of emphasis on rote learning of facts because information was scarce. Today, any kid with access to a phone has access to all the world's information. So rote learning is no longer important, okay? We were training people for industrial era jobs. And so what was most important was compliance, discipline, following rules, being, you know, fitting in. Today, each of us is an explorer. We've got to find a way to make our way through this crazy world. So creativity, problem solving, um, you know, risk taking, all these uh, being entrepreneurial, these are far more important. But which school and college is training people, young people in these things? Almost none. So yeah, so we really have a big, 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 big challenge because what our schools and colleges are met are training people for are exactly the kind of things that computers are better at, okay? So mm -hmm. it is just catastrophic. We're training them to do, do things with software is already better at and is going to be increasingly better at. And we're not training them to be distinctively human and creativity is a distinctively human quality. Anyway, more on that later. We can um, talk about my work at UNICEF, which is basically aimed at that. Sure. Uh, but just taking the conversation a step ahead, you know, like Ravi, you said that you're doing an important program with the Delhi government on teaching entrepreneurship. Uh, but there has always been a very huge criticism uh, of the idea of teaching entrepreneurship at points in time by many writers that you can't teach entrepreneurship. Uh, would you agree with that? And I, I couldn't disagree more vigorously yeah. because all the evidence says, and Saras Saraswati has done the best job writing about it, but her writing is also not very accessible. But all the evidence and our evidence points to the fact that entrepreneurship is a skill. Like any skill, it can be learned. The more you practice, the better you get. And of course, some people have more talent than others. So you do have outliers like a Mark Zuckerberg or a Steve Jobs or whatever in, in India, all the unicorns, sunicorns, whatever we'll see. But it's a skill that's eminently learnable. What you have to do is get people, you know, this mindset shift where people are able to see an opportunity in every problem rather than problems in every opportunity, okay? that they're able to then not just see the opportunity, but begin to take steps 
to do something about it, that they develop a skill called resourcefulness. You know, the, what late C.K. Prahlad used to say is resources don't matter. What matters is resourcefulness, tenacity, not giving up, not, you know, just staying with it till you find success. All these things we have discovered are learnable skills, teachable skills. They're not learnable in a classroom. Unfortunately or fortunately, these can only be learned experientially. And therefore you have to get people to learn these things by doing things in the real world, including launching a list, little business. There's very little point in give, running a business plan competition. What you need to do is quickly get them to actually launch that business, okay, no matter how small and cute it is. But yeah, I hope I've answered your question. And by the way, please, all of you come to our website. It's called massentrepreneurship.org. Everything we do is open source and out there. So you can you know, find all our stories, evidence, experiments out there. So you know, like when you talk about mass entrepreneurship and the activity that you're doing, I think, I think the primary idea for you, uh, and as I understand is that you're looking at moving the whole pendulum from being job seekers to job creators, right? How are you really looking at doing it? Because that's a, such an important step. And you, you also say, say something very important, and that is about creating those ecosystems. Sure. Look, this idea of job seekers to job creators is not new. Many politicians have said this many times over a long period of time. Unfortunately, it's not enough to say it. It's not enough to have a slogan. You've actually got to do something about it. And the doing is not obvious. Um, even in America, where you know they have a Silicon Valley, which everybody wants to emulate, the replication has not been so easy. How many cities are there in the US which are true hotspots of uh, entrepreneurship, okay? There are not too many of them. And there are vast swaths of the country which are not entrepreneurial. So the thing we, to realize is this sort of flourishing of entrepreneurship and dynamism and job creation is the result of a healthy underlying ecosystem. In nature, what is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is, you know, some sort of combination of uh, landscape, soil, uh, life forms, animals, um, and uh, plant life and climate, which come together in a unique way to create a bubble of life. And an ecosystem here is the same thing. And what you need is a combination, Amit, as I've written about, seed, soil, climate. All three have to be at least reasonably good. Seed is the supply of young people with some skills, useful skills, and a lot of energy to go do these things and an entrepreneurial inclination. Soil is a lot about infrastructure. Infrastructure means, look, physical connectivity, digital connectivity, electricity, access to some markets, you know, ac some access to capital finance. Without infrastructure, you can't do much, which is why physically and digitally connecting everybody is so important. And then the most important might be climate. And climate is a combination of two things. One is the values of that place, which is why a Bangalore is so well positioned relative to say another place like Kanpur maybe, okay, or pick, a, pick any place. But the other um, important aspect of climate is how easy or difficult is it to start a business and run a business? Okay, and in, in India, despite all the World Bank rankings and the progress we may have made in the rankings, the real, ground reality in almost every state, no matter which political party is in power, is it's horrendously difficult to start and run a business. So what you have to do if you really want this ecosystem to come together is work on all these pieces and get it to at least some threshold. Okay, so introducing entrepreneurship in the school and college curriculum is very important. So large numbers of people grow up with this kida in their mind, the, the bug in their mind. Okay, now listen, five out of 100 will actually try it. In the other 95 will make for successful employees. Okay, that's fine. Then you have to work on the soil part, which is all the connectivity and infrastructure and so forth. 
And mostly you have to work on, on climate, which is to create the heroic role models that people want to emulate, okay? And the beginnings of these modern values. The, so what we're trying now, Amit, is in Ludhiana and some other cities, experiments to see, can we really turbocharge growth and get the ecosystem to start coming together and in a virtuous spiral? And evidence is early, so it's far from success. So this is just a theory, but we believe this should be possible if we don't give up, okay? And yeah, that's what we do. And there's a lot of interest from a number of state governments to see if we can try something of this sort in their cities. And of course, we learn a lot from failed experiments with good intentions, including Mohali and others that we love to talk about since it's our favorite city. Yeah, so I'll come to Mohali and others, but you make a very important point here again as well about climate, like how do we, or how easy is it to start a business? You know, like the question that here is that today, if I really want to move from informal sector to a formal sector, the compliance burden is so huge. It can be terrifying. Uh, in fact, for an entrepreneur, I think the kind of licenses that I have to look at, the kind of compliances I have to do are absolutely uh, appalling or they, they can just create that shrillness in my mind or his mind that we will not do it. So how do we really, uh, how do you really look at this? The whole idea of the compliance burden, because if I, we are able to reduce it, I think we, we can, half the battle is possibly won. So the most important, I think that's a really wonderful question. The most important thing I'd say is stop fooling yourself with the World Bank rankings, okay? They serve a certain purpose. It's important for us in attracting FDI and F, uh, to demonstrate that we're not a, we're open for business. So taking nothing away from the endeavor to, um, you know, be improve our rankings there. What really matters is what is the experience on the ground for a small person starting a business, okay? And how do you make that better? And as I said, from all that work we have done along with our partners, it remains extraordinarily difficult, a huge headwind to both start and run a business at any scale in India. As you get bigger, above 100 crores and all that, you can start creating infrastructure to deal with this mess. But in the first stages, it is just daunting. So we looked at the regulatory landscape and across all businesses, industries and all that, there's a, you know, a ticket of some 58,000 things you have to, uh, you know, compliances. 10,000 of which have criminal consequences for non-compliance. Um, and some of them are British area things which are completely nonsensical. So for instance, if you didn't lime wash your factory wall, that's a criminal um, uh, violation, okay? And it's there in Punjab, okay? So there's stuff like this, which is legacy of a time when people didn't want businesses to flourish. So um, what we have decided to do is develop an approach which says, let's work with state governments where, which really want to make it a you know, much more dynamic place. And let's measure from the shoes of an entrepreneur uh, what the compliance burden is and how do you make dramatic progress in simplifying things, then decriminalizing, and finally digitizing processes. Because the more you remove the human discretion and intervention, the less the opportunity for human judgment, corruption, extortion, harassment, and all those things that slow you down. And I must say, uh, kudos to government of Punjab and particularly the chief secretary there. Um, we've made enormous progress working as a, a partner coalition between businesses in, in Punjab, um, the industry associations, government of Punjab and civil society. And anybody can Google the progress we've made just in six months. But we've taken, you know, 60% of the regulations are labor related. And we've done about a 50% simplification on that. And it's, it's all been notified and it's actually getting on the ground. Uh, the, there used to be over 110 NOCs for starting a business. We're trying to see if we can get that down to 50 right away. Uh, decriminalizing about 1,100 different things to uh, at least 500 of them, which are low risk. 
um, and then digitizing a bunch of processes. So we hope that we can already demonstrate and I don't know if any folks are here from Niti IO. We've made a number of presentations to them saying, look, this is, I think, a good model to take to many states. Now, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, um, several states have come forward, uh, UP before the election, saying, look, we're really interested in this approach and we'd like to work uh, on trying to make things much easier. We need to do this. That said, Ahmed, one of the things I'll say is in virtually every country, entrepreneurial success happened initially, despite all these burdens, despite all this challenge. And then once few people became successful, they organized, created a NASCOM or whatever, and then started working with the government to make things easier. I think it is somewhat utopian to believe that we'll first make things easier and then entrepreneurship will flourish. There's something about the entrepreneurial spirit which says, I'm going to succeed and thrive despite the challenges and I'm gonna break through. And if you see that the entrepreneurial success in India over 75 years, uh, much of it has happened that way. So I'm not taking away the central importance of making things easy, but I don't think that takes away any, anything from the need to get out there and start driving growth and success. So, you know, uh, Ravi, like when you talk about growth and success, uh, and I, I, I absolutely agree with your point that you have to really go out, do the work, be successful. But at points in time, uh, when you're really talking about compliance, when you're really coordinating with the government or officers or whatever, the common complaint from a lot of people is that you're taken as a thief. You're somebody who's just, uh, just here to cheat. Rather, rather than looking at uh, entrepreneurs as wealth creators, job creators, you're actually seen as blood suckers in many, many ways. I'm sorry for saying that, but I think that seems to be a very big problem in the minds. You're not the first person to say it. Recently, the prime minister has made the same point okay. multiple times in multiple forums saying, this is the shift we need to make. But this is, I think, a beautiful example of a modern value, okay? Do you see an entrepreneur as basically a thief, a cheat, somebody you know inherently corrupt? Or do you celebrate, you know, um, the builder variety of entrepreneurs. I'm separating them from the oligarchic capitalists, the entrepreneurial capitalists. You celebrate them for creating jobs, creating prosperity and wealth. So this shift is part of what I call modern values. And Ravi, you're just taking a step forward, you know, like uh, when you talk about entrepreneurship, and of course there are going to be small entrepreneurs and there are those large entrepreneurs, but what India seems to be lacking, and you, you've also said it in your writing, that there is something like a missing middle. You need those mid, uh, what I call middle success stories, which could be five crores, 10 crores, 20 crores, uh, and things. And that also reflects on our obsession with the whole idea of unicorns. Uh, I, I think we are completely wrong. The whole discourse, the vast majority of us, business leaders, policy makers are just completely wrong on this. The, num the, 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 the numbers are just staggering. Even as I say it for the 10,000th time, I'm still gobsmacked by it. There are 63 million enterprises in, in India. Okay, that's the enterprise landscape. Okay, sounds reasonable. 95% of them, are just one employee, i.e. they're self-employed businesses, okay? 98% will employ less than 10 people, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's only 2% that employ more than 10 people. Then you look at how many reasonable size firms do we have? The last count, there were 19,500 firms, say 20,000 that had share capital of more than 10 crores, which is when you need a company secretary. So you've got a two and a half trillion dollar economy riding on 20,000 reasonable sized firms, okay? It's insane, it's just insane. There's no way you're going to create a modern economy with mass flourishing, i.e. some sense of equity and, um, and so forth if you have this missing middle, okay? We simply don't have enough 
mid-sized firms. And why is that a problem? In any country, jobs are created not by the large guys growing. They grow, but most of it, they grow by driving up productivity. So they are not job creators in that sense. And they're not created by the heroic little people, self-employed entrepreneurs, because they're really not entrepreneurs. They would rather have a job, but they can't find a job. So to stay alive, they open a tea stall or a pakoda stall or a you know, vegetable radar or whatever. They are not growth oriented. So they're not going to hire the second employee for the most part. G job creation, prosperity creation happens by very large numbers of small firms growing to mid-sized firms and some of the mid-sized firms growing to big firms. And in India, this escalator has stopped for at least a decade, okay? And this is because the ecosystem is not healthy. And today we are obsessed with these unicorns, which are the tip of the pyramid. And of course, the unicorns are important from an economic perspective, wealth creation for a few, um, economic, well, from a competitiveness standpoint. But they are typically IQ and capital intensive, not labor intensive. They're, they create very, very narrowly concentrated wealth. Um, and therefore, I think we need to completely shift our mindset towards thinking about this very pervasive entrepreneurial um, movement, pervasive in terms of across sectors, across industries, across the length and breadth of the country. And we need to really, really think, worry about, obsess about how to create conditions where the small people are growing to mid-size and the mid-size are growing to large, okay? This is what we call the escalator. How do and, we and you listen to the policy discourse in our country, this, is, this idea is just missing. It's all about how do we give handouts to save the poor SMEs from dying from COVID. Now, listen, that's important but it's not going to restore them to health and get them to a growth path. They were not growing. There were stunted dwarves even before COVID, okay? There's something inherently unhealthy about the ecosystem. If we don't go back and fix that, you know, all the SOPs and handouts and whatnot are not going to do much. What is that specific point in the ecosystem that you feel is stalling enterprises to move into that middle uh, group? What is that? And what is that specific ask that you might have? That we need to solve this and we will get there. I think it's the growth mindset. We simply don't have enough people with the growth mindset who believe growth is possible, that despite all the many constraints of the country that I can, I can grow and I want to grow. That ambition, that drive, that self-belief, is too narrow today. And there are simply not enough people aspiring to be entrepreneurs in the first place. So in my UNICEF work, we do, uh, we have a platform called UReport, where anybody with a, any phone, it can be even a feature phone with just SMS, we can poll them. And so we poll very large numbers of young people by state, by district, et cetera. Say, for instance, what would you like to be when you, grow up. And in some place like Bangalore, they'll say startup or something. But for the most part, across most of India, it's a government job, okay? Because it's safe and secure. It might be, occasionally, it might be a teacher or something like that. Um, if you're in Punjab, it is to leave in Punjab and leave the country. Okay, go to Canada or Australia or UK or wherever. But it's, if it's a stunningly small number of people who actually say, I want to go start a business. Okay, so we have to raise aspirations. We have to make entrepreneurship aspirational and we have need many more existing people to have this growth mindset. In all our work with entrepreneurs, Amit, the single most important contribution is not what we teach them about how to find customers, cash flow, this, that, all bloody blah, blah. It is they experience growth in 90 days and the self-belief, the aha that sets in takes them further, okay? So if we can spread this virally, good, not a good metaphor for the times, but if we can you know, spread this idea, I think the, a lot will follow. And 
how important you, you actually talked about a modern value on failure and sell, uh, how do we really tackle failure don't you think it might be one of the most important aspects that we need to build within our mindsets that failure has to be celebrated or failure does not have to be looked down upon now right okay. now i think we come from a cultural perspective wherein failure is seen as uh, a negative a curse from the gods or whatever you might actually want to call it yeah it's devastating and it's permanent so yes we have to redefine failure i have a whole chapter of, on that in my new book which comes out in december and to my i think we need to get many more people realizing that the only failure is giving up okay if you look at a example of a child learning to walk a child learning to talk which all of us were at some point that there, there are so many experiments we do step to stand up and flop to walk two steps and flop if you thought that was a failure and give up at that time none of us would be here today right so we have to realize that uh taking risk and taking on new challenges not of all of which will sit, will work the first time is just an inherent part of learning and and progress and so this is again one of the pernicious things in the schooling system around how we are taught about what is failure what is success and reinforced at home and in society this is again that's why i i raised this as one of the modern values we have to redefine what risk taking and the tolerance of failure redefinition of failure and it's a societal issue it's not just uh in the the context of entrepreneurship so just just moving ahead and we're also coming to the uh, yeah we're coming to the end of our time exactly so but i'll i'll just i still have a couple of questions you know like you you said that creation of entrepreneurial ecosystems in a place like uh, ludhiana and there is some positive thing that is happening but right now as i look at it and there are about five or six cities which are fairly entrepreneurial you have uh, gurgaon bangalore pune to a certain certain extent bombay or mumbai hyderabad uh, but then then we we just can't count any more uh, and we have had places like chandigarh also which are interesting places but we have not been able to create those what what is that missing link how, what are those steps we need to take to get there of course there is going to be that mindset change that is required some policy changes what more is required successes mm-hmm. that that's a very, look that you can complicate it and say we have to do these 14 things for the thing to happen it's not going to happen okay nobody has the patience to bring together 14 factors so what you have to say, say is is there one thing that can get that is the locomotive that will pull that will get the whole train going okay so if you say what is the one thing it would be get more extraordinary successes and communicate that like hell so i'll give you another example i'm working with an interesting outfit in toronto right now called creative destruction labs cdl and cdl was started at the university of toronto and the re- reason why they set up cdl is look they've got so much science and technology every bit as good as any of the at boston which is not far away and yet they attract almost no venture capital and they had no unicorns okay so they said look we've got to do something about this so you could say that's true of many cities in india okay Which have reasonable skills reasonable infrastructure sure could be better but they are, but they could be doing so much better so to, toronto started creative destruction labs and what they did was it was essentially an accelerator saying we're going to bring together you know deep tech scientists and technologists and we're going to bring some of the world's smartest scientists engineers investors together and run this program where we accelerate them today they have 12 unicorns sort of four years into it okay and it's create completely changed how people see toronto and then cdl is now i'm trying to get cdl set up in india either bangalore or chennai okay so i think you know i've moved to bangalore around 2003 where it was taking off 
it already had taken off, but it was the flat part of the S curve and then the big spike came in the last 10 years. And it, what was it in those days? And, I've, and my parents lived here from 1990. So I've seen Bangalore since 90. A great deal simply had to do with the early successes. And they were extraordinary successes. They weren't modest little successes. Okay. So I think that changes the imagination of people and the whole ecosystem then begins to come together around this. So this is our thesis. Look, I'm not saying I have the answer. This is right. This is what we're betting on. And this is the experiments we're trying. And we'll see. We may not succeed at everyone. We'll try something else. But again, I think, you know, Ludhiana is a perfectly nice industrial city. It's not good. It doesn't have unicorns and all that stuff. But we've run just one cohort with 25 entrepreneurs, mid-sized ones, 50 lakhs, one crore, not even mid-sized, they're small. And we were able to show substantial growth events in most of them within a quarter. Okay. So now there's a buzz. Okay. So we're going to run cohort two. And we may run many more. And so I think if we stay the course, my sense is it's going to really bring the growth mindset about. Okay. So I think that's the big shift that you need to have in any city. Um, we know in Telangana, for instance, in Hyderabad, if there's any money, the uh, uh, chief minister really wants to, he's saying, look, Hyderabad has everything that Bangalore has without many of its problems of infrastructure and so forth. Why is it that we're getting, you know, not even a tenth of the, the VC funding and so on and so forth? So how do we change that? Their, their answer to that is T-Hub, okay? The similar in concept to CDL, let's see. But I think the thesis is right. If you can get some astonishing successes happening with local entrepreneurs, I think the narrative changes, the imagination changes. Very, very, very interesting. And but I have to ask you one question, uh, Ravi. You know, like uh, when, when we talk about entrepreneurship, when we talk about jobs, like one of the challenges that the country faces is about low female labor participation rates. Uh, and that is actually reduced. And we, we see very few women getting into entrepreneurship as well. They are 50% of us. And how do we really change that as well? Because that, that, that's a huge question that we have to answer for ourselves as a society as well. Look, female participation in the workforce is a separate issue from female entrepreneurship. There are probably factors, causal factors, which affect both but they're two different issues. Both are terrible. So first of all, when you look at workforce participation overall in India, it's a catastrophe that nobody seems to realize, which is it has dropped to about 40, 42%. Now what that means translated into English is 60% of the people on the workforce age group, 18 to whatever, 67, don't even bother looking for a job, they've given up, 60%, okay? Now the workforce participation rate for women is even worse, it's half that, okay, it's 20%, and it has declined. Now everybody's scratching their head trying to understand why did it decline, yeah, it's, and why is it so low? And I'm not an expert on this, we've just hired our um, lead for, 16% now, somebody just says, thank you. Yeah, but there are a number of factors which seem to be very causal and plausible. One is that the economic growth in India has not happened in sectors which are labor intensive and which typically employ large numbers of women. For instance, manufacturing. Manufacturing has actually degrown. Okay. And, you know, you go to a Vietnam or whatever, Malaysia and all, you'll find that the factories are just disproportionately women. Our Cummins factory where I used to work in Pune is disproportionately women. So um, the growth has come in services, particularly in higher skilled services where women's participation is low. So if you look at women in STEM, women in engineering, women in science, their participation is already low, okay? And so 
it reflects in therefore their absorption in the sector. So that's one issue. The second one is a, a just a shameful gender bias when it comes to pay, equity of pay for the same job. We have dropped from 108 to 112 in a list of 153 countries in terms of gender in inequity. So what happens is a woman enters the workforce, she sees her male counterpart out there making more money. She's working every bit as hard, possibly even doing a better job. And then the gap widens. And then by the time she turns you know, 25, 28, 30, she says, why do I bother with this? It's so unfair. And I might as well concentrate on the family, okay? Because by now they're married, have a family. So they drop out. So that's the second factor. And then once you have a child, the lack of infrastructure for childcare tends to be a big, big, big issue. Of course, in India, we have these family and societal nets with parents and in-laws, but still, I think the lack of, so all this contributes to that. The women entrepreneurship is a whole different problem. So on average, 20%, on, in aggregate, 20% of all businesses are women owned. But when you look at businesses that are not self-employed, employ five or more people, that number drops to 5%. So it's tough enough being an entrepreneur, a woman entrepreneur faces even more headwinds. And there are many issues, the lack of peer networks, support groups to learn from, reinforce support to you in your journey, that's one. Lack of business skills is often an issue. We find, for instance, even the reaction of a bank official who won't even entertain a, a conversation with a loan applicant, woman loan applicant, unless she's accompanied by some husband, father, male member. So there's all this societal nonsense at play. So there are just very systematic factors which we have to unlock. And there are some very easy policy unlocks. For instance, if the US has this minority sourcing policy, you know, you need to buy X percent of your procurement from minority owned businesses, which includes women owned businesses. If we had something like that for government procurement, for other procurement, you can begin to move, move the, the needle pretty fast. So anyway, we are just in the early stages of figuring out how to do this. We're working with Gates Foundation to create 10,000 women entrepreneurs in agriculture in Bihar, just Bihar alone, one state. How do we create 10,000 women agri entrepreneurs? So lots of experiments to try and unlock this in different settings. But man, it's a huge, huge hill. So this is very, very, very interesting what you're sharing, Ravi. Uh, but I, I know we can continue to talk on this for hours, but uh, we are just touching, we have touched the end of time, but I still have one more question. Uh, you know, like what books would you suggest? Three top books in your mind. Of course, you can't say Conquering the Chaos, which has been authored by you. Uh, so it has to be three books in your mind, which everybody should read to really learn more. Well, I'd say read my next book then. It's called What the Heck Do I Do With My Life? So the jokes apart. Look, I don't know what books to recommend um, in what in the context of entrepreneurship? Absolutely. Or something that has created that mindset that you have or the way to look at things differently, uh, possibly. I think you need to read more philosophy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and this is going to sound shocking to people, but I think that the old classics are um, still what I, I mean, if you look back there, I have three different versions of the Gita. Okay. Each reading uh, reveals new nuances. There's a beautiful, beautiful book, which I recommend highly to everyone listening in called Being Nobody, Going Nowhere. It's a Buddhist philosophy, but applied in an incredibly practical way. Um, Freeman Dyson's uh, uh, a little book called Disturbing the Universe is something I'm reading right now. It's, it's not new, but it won the, uh, it won a, um, you know, a pretty wonderful award and it's exquisite because look, all this is embedded in the context of life. Okay, yeah, entrepreneurship, jobs, these are all crucially important practical issues. Um, but what, you know, at the end of the day, they're just aspects of life. So having a healthy, 
mindset about life itself is actually the most foundational I've found. So I'm not going to give any practical suggestions. I'm going to say, go back to these timeless treasures and you're going to be well served. But look, um, I, I'm shocked that 40 minutes have passed, Amit, and I, um, and we could talk more and we haven't done justice to the questions, And but you've been a superb interlocutor. And once again, thank you to everybody who uh, tuned in. And I'm available on LinkedIn. I often try and engage and answer questions and, uh, and come to our website as well if you're interested. Thank you, Ravi. This has just been a fascinating and insightful uh, interaction. And I think one big thing that I want to say to everybody, which is a big takeaway, take unleash your mind. Start looking at things from a fresher perspective. Possibly question whatever you see. Have that critical thinking and celebrate a uh, possible failure that you have because success is going to be based on uh, that itself and the mistakes that you do. Uh, so that, that's very, very interesting. Uh, Ravi, it's been a very interesting talk. Thanks a lot for joining in. And I look forward to having the conversation again sometime in December uh, when your book comes out. Thanks a lot. Be well, be safe. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Stay well. Thank you.